starts now. We are in for a doozy today, the epic finale of John Dillinger and Little Bohemia. Babyface Nelson, John Dillinger, and the rest of the gang are on the run. Will they evade the FBI? All right, we are back. It is time to continue our series on John Dillinger and his gang for how we got here. Joining me again is Kay Kranz. And Kay, we left off with the FBI thinking they've completely cornered the gang. They're outside a little bohemia. Meanwhile, gang members are escaping. So I'll let you take it away from there. Okay. As I told you last time, Dillinger, Hamilton, Carroll, and Van Meter have escaped to the north. They're running through the woods north. And now Babyface Nelson, after blasting at the FBI and going back into the lodge, escapes out the back door as well, but he turns south. I'm gonna tell you about Babyface Nelson's escapade first because it's the most dramatic escape. Babyface Nelson runs along the shore of Little Star Lake south and we have to understand in 1934, we're mostly resorts and summer homes. So there's no light anywhere. This is April, no one's here, except the few local people that live here year round. So Babyface Nelson finds a light and heads towards the light. He knocks on the door and it turns out to be um, Paul Lang's Sylvan Lodge Resort. He and his wife are very refined individuals in the community. Mr. Lang is a, is a really good musician, wonderful people. But here this murderer has come to their door with the gun in his hand saying, I need a car, I need it now, and I don't need any whining. And Mrs. Lang bursts into tears and he goes, if you want something to cry about, lady, I can give it to you. So they're terrified. They get into the Lang's car and they drive out their driveway, which is almost perpendicular to the highway, um, to the highway as it is today. But the highway then went right in front of Kerner's resort. Now, Mr. Kerner's the one that owns the telephone exchange. So he has the ability to hear everything that's been going on all weekend long. Anyways. The car dies, I don't know what happened, but the car just dies. The lights go out and the engine just quits right in front of Kerner's. Well, Babyface is like, I'm ready to blow up here. He takes the Langs, puts a gun to their backs and leads them up the steps of Kerner's home and they knock on the door. Kerner answers, thinking it's Paul and his wife. They come in and here's Babyface Nelson. He slams the Kerners up against the wall and he slams the Langs up against the wall and tells them to keep their hands up. And he goes, I need a car. Well, suddenly a car arrives. When Emil had um, come out of the hotel, uh, of his lodge with the bartenders, he had asked the FBI agents if he could go to a friend's to get a coat because he had no coat on and um, his bartenders also needed coats because they had rushed out. So they have been picked up by George Laporte. Remember, George is Nan's brother. He has taken them to Kerner's, which is the closest place to get a coat. They pull in, they all rush up the stairs and go into Kerner's to the site of Nelson with his gun on the four people. And Emil looks at him and he goes, these are my friends, what are you doing? And Babyface Nelson looks at him and says, just shut up and I'm going to take you and I'm going to take this Kerner dude and we're getting in the car, George's car, and we're taking off. So they get outside. Everybody else is inside. They lock the door. Uh, Babyface is in the car, sitting on the passenger side. Emil cannot find the keys. George has taken the keys out of the car and he's in the house just as two FBI agents and the local town constable pull up because they've gotten a call that there's some mysterious behavior in front of Kerner's resort. Kerner has called bosses, the staging area, and says, hey, there's a strange car out here with no lights on. 
So these guys have come to look. They've gotten um, the constable, whose name is Carl Christensen, because at the time, which I think is really interesting, the FBI could not make an arrest. They weren't that far along in the establishment of that organization, so they needed a local guy. So they had picked up Carl Christensen, who ran a tavern with his wife, by the way, which was right across the street from where someone else is going to escape. So anyways, they pull in just Newman, his, it's Special Agent Newman, Special Agent Baum, and Carl Christensen. They pull in and uh, Christensen said, oh, that's a local car, I know that car. Newman rolls down his window and he says, hey, federal agents here, we wanna ask you some questions. Babyface Nelson is ready to explode. He gets out of the car, he pulls his gun, he walks right up to the FBI car. Newman says, uh, and Nelson says, just shut up. He says, I'm gonna hit you high and I'm gonna hit you low and I'm gonna kill you dead because I know you got bulletproof vests on. He opens fire. He hits Newman right across the side of the head with a bullet. Just as he's getting hit with the bullet, he pushes open his door. Newman falls flat on his face out in the snowbank. On the left side of the car, Christensen opens the passenger door, falls out on that side of the car as Babyface is continuing to shoot into the car. And here's Carter Baum in the middle with a bullet in his throat, struggling to breathe. He falls out of the car, flat on his face into the snow, right next to Christensen. Babyface Nelson walks around the rear of the car and opens fire on Christensen. Christensen gets eight bullets to the body and they're left there to die. Nelson jumps into the car, takes off. There's ice, mud splattering on the rear wheels just as Newman comes back to semi-consciousness, pulls his gun and starts shooting at Nelson. Nelson speeds off down the highway south and uh, turns on to what today is Highway H and soon runs off into the marsh from icy roads. He gets out of the car, swearing, abandons it, and has to walk 20 miles on marsh and slush to a house on White Sand Lake owned by an Ojibwe family named Catfish. There he takes them hostage for about five days, manages to get Catfish to help him get a car, and escapes scot free now back to the slaughter area carter Baum is dead carl christensen is near death um, jay newman has a superficial wound to his head which is really very fortunate and he um he tries to go back into kerner's house but they are so traumatized in the house they think babyface nelson may still be there so they won't open the door so Emil. When Netka had been taken hostage as well as Kerner, they have managed to get away while all that gunfire was going on. They ran back to Little Bohemia, alerted them that there's been a bloodbath at Kerner's, and help comes. The night at the uh, hospital in Ironwood, they don't even treat Carl Christensen because they know he's going to die. As a matter of fact, the nurse said that night, don't even put him in a bed. He's not going to last that long. Well, Carl Christensen showed them. After three or four months in the hospital, he recovers. It's just an amazing recovery. Okay, that's that part of the escape. Now again, we have more wounded. So Tommy Carroll, the fourth man that went north, got lost and he ended up in what today is Manitouish Waters at the Northern Lights Lodge across the street from Carl Christensen's tavern. Now it could be that Baum and Newman were picking up Christensen at the same time Tommy Carroll's arriving at the lodge due to the time differences. We don't know. But there's a car sitting in front of the lodge with the keys in it. Tommy Carroll jumps in that car, starts it up, takes off, he's gone, scot free. Now we have um, Dillinger, Hamilton and uh, Van Meter. They go through the woods north and see lights at a place called Mitchell's Resort. Mr. and Mitchell, Mrs. Mitchell are an older couple and they are a very nice couple. Uh, the guys knock at the door and say that their car has broken down and they need help. 
they walk in, Red Hamilton pulls the phone off the wall and says, we're the Dillinger gang and we need a car now. Well, Mr. Mitchell says, I can't help you. He said, my car's up on, um, on uh, blocks for the winter. Dillinger looks out the door and sees the car next door. He said, whose car is that? And he said, well, that's Robert Johnson's car. He said, he's, he's a renter here. They go over, they wake up Robert Johnson, they get him out of bed, they pull him out and he drives the three men to Park Falls. And in Park Falls, they say, well, Mr. Johnson, we're done with you. You can just get out of the car and figure out how you're gonna get home. Goodbye, and they escape. So back at Little Bohemia, the agents are still waiting for the tear gas to arrive so that they can tear gas the gang out. They still haven't put it together that the gang, at least part of the gang is not there. And in the morning, the tear gas arrives, they throw the tear gas in Little Bohemia, and then what happens? Three women, the girlfriends and wives of the gang, walk out with a puppy. That's all that was left at the lodge. It's quite a story. So we have four wounded people and two dead people as a result. So. I guess the result of this whole story is the FBI teetered between, are we going to be an FBI? Are we going to be a federal bureau? They had to make a name for themselves and they had to make it right. So J. Edgar Hoover takes on this guy has got to get captured and this rule of law has to be in place. And so that's the end of my story. But if you want to know more, you can come up north and take a pontoon tour and see all the sites. The Manager's Waters Historical Society and the North Lakeland Discovery Center run tours about the Dillinger story all summer long, and you get to have lunch at Little Bohemia. And the people at Little Bohemia, the owners, have kept it really intact and historical. So it's really kind of a fun place to go, as you know. Thanks so much, Kay, for joining us over the past few days. Really appreciate your storytelling, and I understand why this is one of the most famous stories in the Northwoods. So thank you. Thank you.